whether in India or China, this sixth century Siddhartha from Honan, what would seem meditational parallels for the medieval, inhabit another realm of human ease and nirvana peace. Though Buddhism has declined in India, something of what smiled over Tibet to the Huang Ho and Yellow Sea still sounds in Sanskrit hymns. <laughs> Our civilizations parallel or radiative, both in one. The Chinese sages Lao Tzu and Confucius are more or less contemporary with Buddha, with the rise of Greek wisdom and the climax of Hebrew prophecy. Yet however native Chinese culture, the Hellenistic and Roman trade of the Silk Route, with the eastward spread of Buddhism, fostered as far as Korea and Japan, a vital mutant of something once Greek as the leap from Chang funerary urns, second millennium BC, and remote as Stone Age Mayan. To the caressing line and personal mood of fourth century AD silk painting, with the chin zither setting of a tune plum blossom, traced at the same time, persuasively suggests Where had such play of sophistic elegance been explored, but in the likeliest export product of Greece, those Tanagra figurines, where life is trimmed to the precious turns and poses of new comedy? In China, as in India, the cultured flowering went on and on. This Tang lady at her toilet, from the darkest centuries of Europe, comes a thousand years and more after the wares of Tanagra. Direct influence is not in question, rather the transmission from dynasty to dynasty, without the cyclical upheavals of the West, of an incredibly civilized, post-Hellenic stance. An ultimate refinement, which by the seventh century had spread also to Japan. While the Buddhist-related art spread east and the dwindling empire of Byzantium encapsuled post-classical Christianity, the old Sumerian and Persian centers produced successor kingdoms, which, though they seemed to menace Christendom, preserved and sometimes advanced for European revival Greek knowledge and skills. 
Let the ruined palace of Kusro I, mid-sixth century, near Baghdad, with its elliptical vault of a hundred-foot span, summon from the Parthian wars against Rome, the Persian coup and revival, the subsequent complex of interplays east and west, that brief splendor of Sassanid Iran. <laughs> Let this mosaic detail from the great mosque in Damascus crown the Arabian and Muslim adventure, the religious power structure of Islam, which in its phenomenal spread became host to Sasanian, Jewish and Alexandrian commerce and law. A fit image, landscape, the human form excluded, since here, as in philosophy and mathematics, the Hellenistic has been essentially caught and with something of the abstraction of algebra launched toward the future. Meanwhile, Europe had gone under. Beowulf looks back into the Norse and German myth world of the seventh century and before, heroes struggling in mist-hung monster lairs to catch mood and action in a patchwork of phrases. This foe of God was ghastly Grendel, stalker of moors, grim haunter of marshes. Out of fens and oak forests he fastened on heart's hearth the king's bright mead hall with each murk of nightfall. Seized a thane, sleeping, slashed him to pieces, bit through the bone joints, sucked at the blood stream, gorged flesh in gobbets. Beowulf's death grip wrenched arm and shoulder, sinews sprang asunder, the axle hinge opened. Under the towering hall roof, that hero flung down the clawed limb of Grendel. Was a grimmer geist, Grendel Harten. Mera merk stapa, saith a moras held. Fen on feisten. Herot e ardoda, sink faga sel, suertum nichtum. Feng slap in the rink, slatum wearnum. Bat ban locan, blood edrum drunk. Sin snidum swerch. Sona he him on feng, in wit thankum. Seona wa on sprung on, burston ban lokan, beowulfa alechta, grendless grab, unter heapna hrof. To sense the crisis of life giving reduction as that force sweeps over Europe, amalgamates with Rome, becomes itself fiercely Christian, set down first a fourth century Christian burial hymn by Prudentius with this Apollo Christ from a tomb under St. Peter's. Nos tecta for webimus ossa, we all set fronde frequenti, titulumque et fricida saxa, liquido spargemus odore. That is the close, or is translated by Waddell, but for us heap earth about him, earth with leaves and violets strewn, grave his name, and pour the fragrant balm upon the icy stone. So leap north and over four hundred years to this Merovingian casket and to the Vesselbrunner Gebet in the guttural giant talk of old German. Dat gefregen ich mit Firahim, Firiwitzo Meister, dat ero niwas, noch uf himil, Noch palm, noch einig, noch peres ni was, noch suna ni sheen, noch mano ni lüchta, noch der Mario zeo. Do daro ni wit ni was, entio ni wentio, enti do was, der eino almachtigo hot. Which we may translate after Anglo-Saxon, 
Among mortal men I have heard with main marvel how earth of old was not, nor arched up heaven, nor tree bowl was none, nor marsh worn, nor mountain, nor sun did not shine, nor moon not lighten, nor the merging mere world. But though naught was not there, beginning nor ending, one there and alone was the all-bending God. Having shifted in art to the book of Ebo, Reims, about 820, already German intuitive wonder wakens in Mario Zeo, the fabled sea, with all related possibilities of mare, mara, mare. Where in the cyclical descent did the barbaric reversion and stripping become regenerative? We cannot say. By the 6th century, the Franks had begun the political regrouping which led to Charlemagne, while the monasteries of Ireland and Northumbria gathered the first fruits of letters and art. Though the Echternach lion sign of St. Mark, Northumbria, about 710, does not suffer from being overtamed. Yet the Lindisfarne Gospel from twenty years later suffuses its still metallic lines with the growing humanism of that island of learning. As Ambrose had said at the beginning of the time of troubles, and every Dark Age monastery tried to enact his words, amid the agitations of the world the church remains unmoved, the waves cannot shake her, while around her everything is in horrible chaos, she offers to all the shipwrecked a tranquil port where they will find safety. Not, however, from the Vikings, who seem to be represented in this Lindisfarne relief. As the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records, January 8, 793, the harrying of the heathen miserably destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne by rapine and slaughter. Or as Alcuin, from the court of Charlemagne, never before has such a terror appeared in Britain. It was the opening of 250 years of culminant darkness. Iona was ravaged soon after. St. Columba's monks fled to Kells, north of Dublin, probably taking with them the unfinished book which bears the name of the new monastery. While the sea spewed forth the foreigners over Erin, Annals of Ulster 820. Living in the world of symbol must have prepared the soul for such raiders. Each Christian sat, like this St. John, holding the gospel at the centre of a calligraphic gospel, which shows by the cloudy head at the top, the hands at the sides, and the pierced feet below, that it is the crucified Christ. On the continent, Charlemagne welcomed scholars from the islands to the shelter of his palace school, and it was an island too, hard-held, between the earlier unrest of Germans, Huns and Moors, and the onslaught of Vikings and Magyars to follow post-classical, pre-Western, an Arctic solstice, where the twilight meets the dawn. Its central poem is the lament for Alcuin on his leaving Aachen, either by the master himself or by his pupil Fredugus. The Augustinian memory of his little house, O oh, Mercella, mihi habitatio dulcis amata, pomiferis redolent ramus tua claustra per hortos, and all thy cloisters smell of apple orchards, yields to the starker burden of loss and faith. So passes all the beauty of the earth, O flying world, that we, sick-hearted, love thee. Still thou escapest here, there, everywhere, slipping down from us. Fly then, if thou wilt. Our hearts are set in the strong love of God. Nos miseri cur te fugitivum mundus amamus, tu fugiens fugias, Christum nos semper amemus. Such is the ground of the dark ages. Perhaps the St. John's page from the Reichs of Angelea is the sombrest art revival of Roman mellowness in that German Christian winter. The gathered toga, the bearded meditation, the sad little garden of shrubs, as in the lament, Undique te cinget ramis resonantibus arbos. Repeat, O flying world, that we sick-hearted love thee, and our hearts are set in the strong love of God. 
Here, on the threshold of the West, the Western antinomies appear, against the shadowed piety of the palace school, the reckless vital line of the Utrecht Psalter, and in thought, Hrabanus Maurus, pious churchman, at his best in monastic greetings, as to grim old abbot of St. Gaul, Waddell, and God, who brought us on this earth together, bring us together in his house of heaven comes into history, linked in furious opposition, jailer and inquisitor of his fiery ward, Gottschalk, the first whom logic led toward Calvin's heresy of predestination. Everything about him speaks passion, from his recusant stand to the first personal rhymed lyrics he wrote in prison. O oh, quid jubis pusiole, Carmen dulce me cantare. Even more prophetically strange, was that John Scotus, the wise original, Erin Bourne, Irish translator of the mystic Areopagite, called in to answer Gottschalk, should dissolve predestination only in a pantheistic Christian Platonism of the universe as God in processu, drawn toward a deificatio, or resumption of all nature, evil and good, even Satan himself, into the divine. Evil will have its consummation and will not remain in any nature since the divine nature will work and be manifest in all. In his knowing revival of pagan and Christian antiquity, Erigena shares the robed richness of the palace school. In the freedom with which he absorbs the world into God, who subsists, he said, as the essence of all, he rather suggests the racing sketchwork of the Utrecht Psalter, where objects are fused in sacred energies. While the Irish tradition from which he stems, least like him in classical surface, may be nearest to his visionary ecstasy, as in this book of Kells, page of the birth of Christ, where the monograms, key, row, and the rest, threaded through with live geometries, less illustrate than form the divine substance of Matthew 1, 18, Christi Generatio. The aim is not to match this with that, but to perceive in the Carolingian ferment how the later Western forms of art, of thought, of personality itself are being explored nowhere more masterfully than in the Ras Gospel Book of Ebo, which alchemizes into one the togged weight of the palace school and the expressive frenzy of the Utrecht line, giant precursors, these miniatures. Claudius, ninth century Bishop of Turin, tried and condemned but never crushed, gives the new force an Italian voice. He is not the apostle who sits in the seat of the apostle, but who fulfills the life and office. Why bend your body to worship vain images? God made you erect. Let no man trust in saints, but as he holds the faith and truth and justice of the saints. So the Castel Seprio frescoes, probably of the ninth century, startle us with the prophetic eruption of spatial and humanistic power, hung like the Carolingian between past and future. The death of Charlemagne, 814, the wars of succession, the battle of Fontenoy, 841, maledicta dies illa, Angilbert, which drained the blood of France, left Europe exposed as the islands had been. The long boats with the carved prows moved up the rivers. The chant went up in the churches, A furore normanorum libera nos domine. The sibyl's prophecy for one thousand seemed fulfilled. A sword age, a wind age, a wolf age. Utrecht burned, Charlemagne's palace sacked. The cities of France mowed down. Périgueux, Limoges, Angoulême, Toulouse, Angers, Orléans, Rouen and then the Mediterranean. While Saracens fixed mountain eyries in Italy and Provence, and the Turkish Magyars terrorized the East, raiding yearly, often as far as the Rhine, even the sacred shrines of refuge, Tours, Corby, Reichenau, Fulda, whence had echoed the greetings of Colman, Alcuin, Maurus, were not secure. And may God give thee in thy hands the green, unwithering palm of everlasting life. This by Strabo, also to Grimold of St. Gaul, 
St. Gaul, at the Swiss heart of Europe, to be plundered in 926 by the Hungarians. The beloved Bishop Radbob of Utrecht, later visited in his illness by the Blessed Virgin with Agnes and Thecla, wrote of the time, Waddell. In the year of the incarnation of our Lord 900, there appeared a marvellous sign in heaven, for the stars were seen to flow from the very height of the heaven to the lowest horizon. Woeful calamities followed, untowardness of the seasons and frequent tempests, rivers overflowing their banks, and ominous upheavals of men boasting themselves against God. The epitaph which follows the record closes. Long hunger wasted the world wanderer. With sight of thee may he be satisfied. The tenth century moves in the forehall of the doom the millennium was supposed to bring. The Synod at Trosley 909 echoes Gregory on the Lombards. The cities are depopulated, the monasteries ruined, men devour one another like fishes in the sea. Of the end of the century, Glaber chronicles. Perilous times were at hand for men's souls about the thousandth year after the birth of our Lord. Almost all the cities of Italy and Gaul were ravaged by flames of fire. At this same time, a horrible plague raged among men. By one thousand, the art of the Rhine has the bare force of sainted bones rising at the last day. We would wish, but there is no way, to resume the sequence in music, to hear the barbarian chanting voices spill down over Rome, the transformation of Gregorian as missionaries spread it north. The varying liturgies, Mozarabic, Celtic, Frankish, to experience as Charlemagne did in the churches of his kingdom, so the monk of St. Gaul, distinctions of rhythm, intonation, even melody, and perhaps harmony, Gottschalk's accuser, Maurus of Mainz, declaiming against the theatrical style of his singers, innovations no doubt as startling as the visual leaps of the Utrecht Psalter, or the first monumental carving of the West, the Irish crosses from the forty-year recess, early tenth century, in the Viking raids. <laughs> Where are the musical parallels for the loss and stripping, the heightening of force so clear in the imprints of art, from the ease of Christian Rome, about 440, Santa Maria Maggiore left, through the absorption of Eastern and Barbarian, Coptic, Syrian, Moslem, with Celtic and German, to the final cutting edge right of the Beatus commentary from 1100 Spain. If only we could exhibit that vital stiffening in the rhythms of song, ephemeral poor music, it is all lost, where the notes survive as with the reconstructed liturgy of the same Spain. Today's monks, trained in the would-be 5th century practice of solemn, melt all styles into one. This Mozarabic lamentation, indistinguishable from ambrosia. For the complex of barbarian, Byzantine, and classical, hardening as to encapsule the radiant of rhyme, sequence, and polyphony, all we get in effect is the attempt at Roman Christian revival, moody as this page of evangelists from the Aachen Gospels, or as Alcuin's Latin lament, Nos misere, cur te fugitivum, mundus amamus. An art which looks over a solemn gulf to the Roman Christian, whether of east or west, this of the sixth century from Sinai. 
Against it stands in music a single recorded interpretation of a more strident Gregorian, which Guillaume de Van and his group made for Anthology Sonore, Billy Van from Texas, who founded the frenetic style of Gothic and set himself here, like the Gauls, as the Romans complained, with their barbaric voices crushing the melodies in their throats to recover a Byzantine-affined Gregorian of about 1,000. It lacks the suave beauty of Solem, but it will, in fact, accompany the Reichenauer manuscripts of the 10th century, the lean style of the Atos, which no Solem version will do. No. Meanwhile, under those now irrecoverable variants of plain song, the practice of organizing in chords was turning, without wish or knowledge, from the surrender of Gregorian to what would become the musical command of space. Here we should extend to music the contrast already made between Charlemagne's chapel of the Hagia Sophia, to which Byzantine chant, as practiced on Mount Athos, old refuge of the Virgin from the Dragon, exhibits still, over 1400 years of changing style and notation, some strangely related hypnotic strength. While with the cramped and struggling height of shock.